I start, I would like to maybe share a little bit about my background. Like what uh, Brother Lim said, you know, I'm, I'm not a Malaysian. Even though a lot of people thought that I'm a Malaysian, that I speak like a Malaysian, I sound like one, I look like one, but uh, I am not a Malaysian. Yeah. So I'm currently here in Malaysia for the 12th year under the Malaysia Second Home Team. Yeah, I'm, I'm married with two children. We live in Subang Jaya. I'm a businessman in a marketplace, but also a marketplace minister. That means uh, um, a lot of my time was spent uh, doing equipping, especially in personal evangelism and in discipleship. All right. Um, what I would like to share with you is uh, it, has all, it has not always been like that. Right? When I first came to Malaysia, I remember 11 years ago, and uh, I've, I am in the F&B industry. I opened my first outlet in Samway Pyramid on the Merdeka Day. Yeah, so 31st of uh, August, 2009. I remember at that time, you know, when I first started the business here, the business was blooming. Uh, I was booming and, and, and I was doing very well financially, right? Um, I was making like uh, millions every, every month, every, not every month, every year, I mean, every year, right? And as a young man, being ambitious and all that, you know, what happened was my heart started to change towards God. You see, the Bible says in Matthew 6, 24, that you can only worship either mammon or you can worship God. And without me knowing it, I have allowed mammon or the love of money to become my God. Okay, this is not something that I'm proud of, but I would like to share this because I know that there are some of you here who can probably relate to my story, right? Money has such a draw and such a power to draw us away from God. Because let's face it, with money, you can do a lot of things on this earth. Without money, you cannot do a lot of things, right? And people say that, oh yes, money cannot buy everything, but it's more comfortable to cry in a BMW rather than to cry on a bicycle. <laughs> That's what they say as well, right? So when I first started and I was in my early 30s, I started to make a lot of money and uh, my passion for God, for, for our souls, for ministry, started to become colder and colder. Even though when I was much younger, I was safe as a teenager, I was on fire, I was on zeal for the Lord. I remember I was sharing the gospel to my classmates. I was leading them to the Lord. I was bringing a lot of them to the church, right? But because of my love for money, the desire was eroded slowly but surely. I came to a point where I was uh, depressed most of the time because I made some very wrong decisions. I made some very wrong investments, right? In my, uh, in my zeal to expand the business, I started to invest blindly, okay? Because I had a lot of money back then. And I started to invest in projects that uh, I was not very familiar in. And I started to lose like hundreds of thousands of, of, of ringgit at that time. And that devastated me, okay? Because, you know, my heart was so attached to it. Right? It was a very devastating time. I was down most of the time. But you know what? God spoke to me during my valley period in my life. You know, oftentimes God doesn't speak to us when uh, we are, everything is going well, when we are successful. It's not that God is not speaking, but we are not sensitive to his voice when everything is going well. Right? How many of you can relate with me on that? But it is during the down period of our time it is when things are challenging. Okay, when we are going through a personal crisis, that is when God's voice becomes especially loud. And that is exactly what I experienced. Right? This was, um, I think, the third or the fourth year I was in Malaysia, right? Are you looking um, foreigners who are on NM2H program to speak? Sorry? Okay, I'll continue with my story, yeah? So at that time, um, I became very depressed. And that was when God spoke to me. And he told me, Nelson, all this money that you've been accumulating, can you bring them with you over to the other side? And I said, no, Lord. Then he asked me again, who is your God? Is it me or is it money? That was when I realized that I crossed the line. I have made Mammon my God. And God had to allow me to go through that difficult period of time 
to teach me that you know, money is not the most important thing in life. Yeah, it is an expensive lesson, but looking back, I am so grateful that I had to go through that period of time. Yeah, and after that, you know, I, I started to think about what are the things that will have eternal value. I remember you know, when my mom passed away, when I was only 23 years old, I saw how when she passed away, she didn't carry a single sense that she's been saving for, for so long, right? She couldn't even bring with her to heaven the clothes that she was wearing. When we leave this earth, we will not be able to bring any of our material possession. The only thing that we can bring with us will be the souls that we lead to the Lord, the people that we impact and touch while we are here on earth. You see, at the end of our life, our life will not be evaluated based on how much money you have in the bank, how many houses you have accumulated, how many properties you have bought, right? how many businesses you have, you have amassed for yourself. But our life will be evaluated based on how much we have love. How much we have loved God, how much we have loved people. Amen? And at that time, the Lord started to put in my heart again that I need to do you know, what he has commanded me to do. And he has made his commandment and his commission so clear to us. You know, that is how we can actually sum up Christianity. Christianity, brothers and sisters, oh no, there's no sisters here, right? Brothers and brothers, it is only the great commandment and the great commission. Christianity can be summed up in loving God, loving others, and his command for us to go and make disciples. It's as simple as that, right? And uh, as I was uh, thinking about what is the message that I can share, you know, that will be of greatest influence, greatest impact to all of you. And I thought I would like to share with you, you know, the, uh, my, my experience, how I came from this salesman kind of mindset where everything was about money and sales to salesman, right? Where my focus is now about souls, and about touching lives, right? So who is in me from this journey from salesman to salesman, amen? All right. Now, I believe with all my heart that God has a plan and a purpose for every single one of us here. But oftentimes, oh, by the way, how many of you agree with me that God has a plan and purpose for you? A specific plan and purpose for you? Okay, that is unique to, to you. Can you raise your hand so I see you wherever, wherever you are? Okay, good. However, even though we say that God has a plan and a purpose for us, oftentimes at the back of our mind, we have this sacred and secular divide. We compartmentalize the things of God that are, are, are sacred and you know our secular lifestyle. Let me explain what that means. Those of us, especially, can I see if you are in the marketplace right now, which means you are not in the, uh, you, you are not employed in the church or you are not in full-time ministry. Can you raise your hand if you are either a professional or you are a businessman or you are in the marketplace? Okay. How many of you are in the full-time ministry? If you're in full-time ministry, raise your hand. Okay. We have one, one brother. Okay. Two brothers. That's it, right? So majority of us are in the marketplace. And I used to think that God will only use those people. God has only called those people who are in full-time ministry. I used to think that if you want to serve God, the only way you can do that is through the church. Sunday on Sunday uh, service, that is your only platform to serve the church. But boy, was I wrong. Because God's plan and purpose is, encompasses everyone. And it's not limited to only on Sunday. It is not only for those who are called to become a minister in the church. In fact, God has called every single one of us, wherever we are placed okay, in the marketplace, to serve him in our own sphere of influence. So it doesn't matter if you are in government or politics. It doesn't matter if you're in the arts and entertainment industry. It doesn't matter if you're in media doesn't matter if you are in the family, okay, sphere of influence, or in religion or church. doesn't matter if you're in education, all right? It doesn't matter if, uh, you know, you are in, uh, what have I, media, all right? 
It doesn't matter if you are in any of this sphere of influence. God has called you wherever you are, okay, to bring glory to Him. Okay, that has been God's eternal purpose right from the beginning. Okay, in the beginning, when God created man, He said, go you know, and, 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 and multiply, right? Okay, multiply, take dominion and subdue okay, the world. His mandate has never changed. Okay? God has always wanted us you know, to, to, to bring down the kingdom of God here on earth, wherever we are. So if you are in education, if you're in economy or in a business, you are to bring the kingdom of God wherever you are. However, because of this sacred versus secular divide mindset, many of us do not think that our business can be used by God as a platform to serve Him. Many of us do not think that your, your occupation or your business or your career can be a platform where God can use to proclaim and to demonstrate the gospel. But today, this, I, I, would say, I would say that this is one of the most important message that the church needs to grasp. That the Lord wants to use every single person. Okay? Even if you are not called to a full-time ministry. You know, the late uh, Billy Graham, he once said that lay people okay, is the single greatest army okay, and the single greatest uh, task force that is underutilized. However, mobilizing the lay people is the key to world evangelism. We know that the, the, the Lord, our Lord Jesus said, you know, in Matthew 24, 14, he said that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the ends of the earth and then the end shall come. Brothers, we are living at the end of the end time. All the signs around us is pointing towards that. Okay, this pandemic has made, it, has made end time even more real than ever. Who would have guessed a year ago that we will never be able to worship in the church in the last building that we, like we used to? None of us expect that a year ago. No, no, none of us would have believed that. However, today we see that, you know, uh, we see that what we used to take for granted is now impossible, right? Many churches are still not, a big, uh, are still not able to meet like uh, they used to. And let me tell you that things are going to get worse. Just the, the Bible says so, right? There will be rumors of war. There will be pandemic, right? There will be, uh, 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 you know, people's hearts will grow cold towards one another, Right? People will hate one another. Right? There will be persecution. If you are a Christian, you'll be handed you know, because of uh, your faith. Things are going to get worse. That is the bad news. But the good news is there is something that we can do in this time and hour. God has a specific place and purpose for you. Wherever you have been planted in your sphere of influence, God wants you to manifest the kingdom of God. So let me tell you, brothers, that the gospel is not so that when we die, we will go to heaven. Yes, that's true. When we die, if we put our faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, if we truly trust in Him, if we have repented from our sin, yes, we are going to end up with Him in heaven for eternity. But that is not the main purpose why Jesus came to earth. He didn't die so that just, you, just so that you can go to heaven. The main purpose why Jesus died on the cross for us is so that you know, we can bring down heaven here on earth. Eternal life doesn't start when you die. Eternal life starts right here and right now. Amen? Instead of thinking, okay, I'm going to escape this world because it's full of corruption, because it's full of brokenness, we should change our mindset because God wants to use you. God wants to use all of us, wherever we are, okay, to display His kingdom. Okay, to display the kingdom values, the kingdom principles, to display his love for this world that is lost, to this dying world. In fact, when you talk about the gospel, the gospel is actually very simple. Now, I would like to interact a little bit with you. Can somebody share with me, in your understanding, what is the gospel all about? I have uh, some ministry partners here, right? Uh, Praise Peter and Lovely Loy, right? And uh, there are some familiar faces as well. But this is open to any one of you, all right? So in your best understanding, how can you sum up what the gospel is all about? You can unmute yourself, 
or you can just type uh, if you are shy you don't want to talk you can type your answers in the chat chat box go ahead brother strong steven uh, gospel is about the love of jesus the love of jesus yes. right good let's hear any other answer do we have any other answer good news about the the free gift of eternal life is a good news of the free gift of eternal life all right very good anyone else The gospel is about Jesus died me so that I can live him. Okay, the gospel is about Jesus dying for me so that I can live for him. For me, so that I can live for him. That's a very good, very good definition. All right, how about, and how about the uh, mm. gospel is about repentance. The gospel is about repentance. Okay, very good answer. All of those answers are very good. But uh, may I challenge you to go a little bit deeper? Can somebody help to read from Genesis 2, verse 7? Genesis 2, verse 7. Let's go back to the beginning, right? When man and when God created man. If you have found it, somebody help me to read it for us. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. Amen. Okay, let me repeat that to you, yeah? And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Amen? So, what do you think, in essence, the relationship between man and God? You know, from this verse, what can you summarize the relationship between man and God? We are his creator. He is the creator. We are the creation. Okay. Anything else? Let's go a little bit deeper. He gave us life. He gave us life. Okay. Very good. He can be his instrument. We can be his instrument. Very good. We and are created in his image to we rule are the created. world together with him. Very good. We are created in his image. Father and son's relationship. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So how, how else will this verse speak to you? Genesis 2, 7. The Lord God formed man from... Okay, let me just... Uh, okay, I've just posted the verse in the... Group chat. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. How else does this verse speak to you? We came from dust. To him. We are related to, to him through his spirit. We are related to him through the spirit. I like that answer, uh, Brother Musical Moses. Okay. And then our, our yeah. gifts, our gifts, our talent, whatever we have, um, everything belongs to him because he breathed the breath of life in us. So whatever whatever talents and gifts is from the Lord. Very good. And uh, just now, Brother Musical Moses said a very important point, right? We have through even though we are being physical man, man was in essence have this spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with God. Amen? Because he breathed his spirit into <clears throat> us. But brothers, what happened uh, after the fall? After man decided to rebel against him? What happened? What happened to this spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship? It's broken. It's broken. And what did God say will be the consequences when man rebel against him? Death, a physical death, and physical spiritually death as well. Amen. Isn't that so true? Right? We are all going to die physically, but that is not the scariest thing. The scariest thing is spiritually, the moment God and man rebel against God, we are all dead already. So, brothers, when you go out there, you might see people who are smiling. You may see people who are very happy about life, but just so that you know, they are dead spiritually. 
So everywhere we go, we see dead people. So with that definition, you know, of our relationship with God, we can redefine the gospel as bringing dead man back to life. Amen? That's what the gospel is all about. Why did Amen. Jesus have to come to earth? It is to bring men who were spiritually dead, who were estranged from him, who were separated from him, who had rebelled against him, who were under his wrath, right? To be back unto life. And that is all of us. That is why the Bible says that you are his ambassadors. Okay? He is pleading through us so that we will preach this message of reconciliation. So that man everywhere all right, will be reconciled to God. And the only way they could do that is through the cross. Is through the blood of Jesus. Because he was the only one who, uh, who fit the bill. He was the only one who was righteous. There is no other person on earth who could lead a perfect life. There is no other person who, who fulfilled the criteria of being righteous enough. And when we introduce man back to this relationship with God, let me tell you what happens. The shalom of God, the peace of God. And by the way, it's not just you know, the, the, the peace feeling in the hearts. When I talk about shalom, I'm talking about this wholesome relationship with God being restored. But that's not all, brothers. When a man comes to Christ, they become at peace with themselves as well. Okay, but that's not all. They become at peace in a wholesome relationship with one another as well. But that is not all. The fourth dimension is there is this wholesome relationship with the environment as well. Do you know that when man rebelled against God with the fall of man, creation is also under this grown uh, under this burden and this groaning so that one day it will be redeemed right we are not living in a perfect world that's why we see there's pandemic there's natural disasters right there are all these terrible things happening in the world but in the book of revelation what did the bible says what will happen right in the end right uh, can somebody uh, help me to read from uh, revelations 21 verse 1 to to five. I will I will paste this in the chat group so that it's easier. You don't have to look for it anymore. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with man, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Can God's people say Amen? Amen? Amen. amen. So we have seen in the beginning, God has intended for man to be his regents here on earth. He has placed the dominion of this earth under the rule of man, right? So that we can bring the kingdom of God here on earth. However, what happened is man rebelled against God and we walked out of this authority. We willingly handed the authority over to Satan. That is why the world as we know it today is under such a big mess. That is why there is tears, there is sorrow, there is mourning, there is death, right? Because of our rebellion, okay? And yet, there are people in the world who still have the audacity to point a finger back at God and say, God, why do you create all this suffering and evil? When it is clearly man's fault, we are the one who walked out of the covering. We are the one who rebelled against him. We are the one who didn't want to be ruled by him. We are the one who didn't want to obey him. However, Jesus died on the cross. 
Okay, he came in and inter intervened. God took the initiative to do what we are not able to do on our, on our own. Right? That is why the gospel is so important. And the good news, brothers, is, it is not, the world is not going to stay like that forever. This world as we know it will pass away. And Jesus made it very clear that there will be new heaven and new earth. Aren't you rejoicing because of this? Isn't that a good news to all of us? Right? He will make everything new again. For the first heaven and the first earth, that is the earth that we are living in today, that will pass away. Okay? And the sea was no more. Because the sea is something that separates us one from another. Okay? I cannot see my family members in Singapore. I cannot see my family members in Indonesia because of the sea. The sea divided us. But the Bible says that the sea was no more. It means there will be no more separation. Right? And then... Um, he says that the dwelling place of God is with man. This is God's intent right from the beginning. He wants us to be his, to be his people. He wants to have this fellowship. Okay? He wants to dwell with us. Okay? Christianity is not about behavior modification. It's about relationship okay? with our maker, with our creator. Okay? And he will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Coronavirus shall be no more. Amen? There shall be no more mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Behold, I'm making all things new. So the good news is in the end, Jesus is going to win. Everything will be restored. Everything will be made new. However, before we reach that time, Jesus gave us a very important commission. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, everyone on earth needs to hear the good news that Jesus has come to reconcile sinful men back to him, okay? back with the Father. Jesus has come to make us citizens of this kingdom of God. Jesus has come so that we can receive the redemption from our sins, so that we can be made a new creation, so that the old us, the old man, can die with him. We will be buried with him and resurrect with him. And that is the good news. That is what the gospel is all about, brothers and sisters. And when we understand that, you know, we have a purpose in our life. It is not, uh, we live our life a mediocre life so that, you know, when we die, we're going to go to heaven. Okay, don't cheapen the gospel, all right? Yes, it's true. When you pass away from this earth, you will have eternal life with Him forever and ever if you put your trust in Him. However, while we are still here on earth, God has a plan and a purpose for every single one of us. He wants us to manifest the kingdom of God wherever we are. So if you are a businessman, demonstrate the kingdom of God where you are. Show through your action, show through your good works, the love of God that you have received from Him. You see, the world has not experienced this grace. The world has not experienced this love. That is why even though they can flourish you know, in, in business, uh, people in the world, even though they can flourish in any areas of your other life, right? What, who do you think they are glorifying? You know, if the people of the world do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, okay, when they accomplish all these things, who are they glorifying in the end? Who do you think the people of the world are glorifying through all the achievements, through all the good works that they're doing? Who can share uh, the answer? It's okay if it's wrong. I would like to hear from you. What do you think? They're glorifying themselves. All right. Who was speaking just now? Peter. 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 Okay. Uh, praise Peter. All right. Thank you, Brother Peter. That is so true. If a man doesn't have a relationship with the living God, isn't it so true that the person that they are glorifying itself is man, right? But right from the beginning, everything we do should be done to the glory of God, right? All of creation is created to sing His praises, to glorify Him. He created the birds in the air, the fish in the sea, all the nature around us. They are all singing glory to God. 
when we look at the beautiful nature, when we look at the birds in the air, when we look at the fish in the sea, just by being who they are and doing what they are created to do, they are glorifying God. You see, but man, when men fall into sin, okay, instead of glorifying God, you know, they are glorifying themselves. Right? So um, I'd like to read a few scriptures so that we know, you know, uh, what Jesus has asked us to do. Can uh, somebody help me to read Matthew 5.16. Matthew 5.16. Let me post a few of these verses. Let, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Okay. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to who? Your Father in heaven. Amen? So that is why He has died for us. Not only so that we can go to heaven, but while we are here on earth, we will establish the kingdom of God. So that through our good works, the name of God be glorified. Okay, so before you learn how to proclaim the gospel, brothers, most importantly is you need to learn how to demonstrate the gospel first. The biggest complaint against Christians is they do not walk the talk. You can preach a good sermon, but if your lifestyle does not reflect that, then your, your words do not carry power. Okay, so the demonstration of a gospel and the proclamation of a gospel need to go hand in hand. Okay, both are important. Right? Okay, so let's read another passage uh, in 1 Corinthians 10.31. I've already uh, posted the, the verses on the chat, chat group and the chat box. Can somebody help me to read? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Amen. Where you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That is our chief purpose of man, right? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Now, here's the question. How do you glorify God when you're eating? Can somebody share with me? How do you how do you eat and drink to the glory of God? It's okay. There is no wrong answer. Please try to, uh, you know, try your best. How can we eat and drink to the glory of God? Does somebody want thanks. to give try? thanks? Give thanks. Okay. Who who, who said that? Oh, real Raymond say giving thanks. Yes, that's a good answer. Is there any other way how we can give glory to God by eating? Share, share our testimony. Share our testimony while we're eating? Yeah, why God yeah. is so good. Give our food and drink to, to the poor. To the poor, uh -huh. okay. All right. Or it could be something as simple as, you know, when you're enjoying that chocolate cake, right? Or when you are drinking that cup of coffee, you're like, God... I thank you for such a beautiful taste bud so that I can enjoy this wonderful food or this wonderful coffee. You know, you are giving thanks to him in everything. You are glorifying him in the smallest little thing in life. Now, if you can lead your life in such a way and people around you are looking at you, there is something different about you. In everything that you do, you are doing it for his glory. When a, a, People around you are complaining, you know, about the pandemic, about the financial crisis. When people around you are complaining about how tough this time has been, how challenging it has been, you are different from the rest. You are giving thanks to Him in all circumstances. Aren't you setting yourself apart in the marketplace? Aren't you demonstrating the gospel when you do that? Because people see, hey, this, there's something different about this brother, about this man. I wonder what it is that gives him such a hope. I wonder what gives him such a peace and such a joy in the midst of these difficult circumstances. You see, brother, when you can live that out, when you can glorify God in everything that you do, you know, if you are a businessman, when you are doing business, you know, you do not cut corners, you do not do uh, business by, by, by uh, doing illegal or unethical practices, right, in order to make more profit. But in everything you do, you place God first and you do things with integrity. You, do, you treat people with love. 
and you think, okay, is this the most loving way I can treat my customers? It is the most loving way I can treat my business partners. Is this the most loving way I can treat my employees? Now, if you can live like that in everything that you are doing, don't you think that's a very powerful way to live? To give that give glory to God. And by that, you are demonstrating the power of the gospel through you. Amen. Uh, Brother Peter Bu said, Man tends to look at the superstructure, big cars, houses, achievements, but their substructure in their life are ignored, corrupted, and decaying. We should be different. Amen, Brother Peter Bu. That is such a good, uh, sorry, Pete Bu. That is such a good observation. Yeah? We should be different from the world around us. Otherwise, our words do not carry power. All right, one more verse. Can somebody help me read uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, sorry, Colossians 3, 23 to 25? Maybe uh, to save time, Brother Strong Stephen, can you help me read? I've posted it on the window, chat window, so you can read it from there. Colossians 3, 23 to 25. Oh, you are muted, brother. Sorry. Yeah. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for man, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Amen. This is one of my favorite verse. I don't know about you, but I love this verse. It said, in whatever you, you found your hands to do, work heartily, not for man, but for the Lord. You see, the gospel is so that is, is to bring man back to God, right? In the past, when we sin, before we know Christ, who is the one who is enthroned in our hearts? It is our own ego, right? But the gospel is simple. It is about dethroning our ego and to put Christ on the throne of our hearts. Brothers, the gospel is not just believing in Jesus as Savior so that when you die, you go to heaven. But there is this very important part that is the lordship of Jesus over your life. And this is a part that is oftentimes neglected when we share the gospel. Okay, so that uh, I, I want to stress this so that when you share the gospel the next time, you will also stress that it is also about the lordship of Jesus over all areas of our life. That is what the gospel of the kingdom is all about. So that he will be the king over your life. The okay, gospel of the kingdom, first of all, is about a king. Then after that, it's about the dominion, right? That's where the word kingdom comes from. King and the dominion. When Jesus becomes your king, when he becomes your Lord, he rules through you in your sphere of influence. So that in whatever you, things that you are doing, you are giving glory to him. That is how we demonstrate the gospel. But that is only the first part, all right? Demonstrating the gospel only is not enough. We need the other part that is proclamation of the gospel. Okay, so let us read a few more verses. Um, let me paste the verses so that some of you can help me read it. Okay, 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. Can uh, maybe Brother Joy Jimmy, are you there? Can you help me to read this verse please? 2 Timothy 4 verse 2. Okay, now let me... Okay. Uh, okay hold on. Preach the word, be ready in seasons and out of seasons. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with, with complete patience and teaching. Amen. Amen. So not only demonstrating the gospel through our life, through our actions, but preach the word in season. Be ready in season, out of season. Brothers, the only way that you can be of influence in your marketplace is if you are ready at all time. You don't only go during evangelism month. You don't only share the gospel when your church asks you to do so. You, only, you don't only share the gospel when you are doing evangelism training. But wherever you are, whatever opportunity that you are given, you will share the word in season or out of season. Even, true evangelism is not a program but it is a lifestyle. It is something that we can do anywhere and everywhere. When I understood this, it changed my life. In 2013, I was trained 
in Malang in an organization called Evangelism Explosion. And we were taught that you know, evangelism is not just the responsibility of the pastors. It's not only the responsibility of the evangelists, but it is the responsibility of every single Christian. So if you call yourself a believer, the Great Commission is for you. Okay? But uh, what do you think are the reasons or the excuses that Christians give or that we give so as we not share the gospel wherever we are? Can I hear from some brothers? Why do you think, even though we know that the Great Commission is so important, but we don't do it, we don't preach the good news? Brother Strong Stephen? Perhaps uh, fearful. Fearful, very good. A shame of the gospel. A shame of a gospel. Interesting. Roman 1.16. Yeah. Isn't it so true? Oftentimes, you know, we do not want to preach the gospel because we are shameful of it. What will people think of me if I preach something as nonsensical as something, somebody who died 2,000 years ago? Right? And what does that have to do with us? To take away your sin? Nobody likes to be called a sinner. Right? We justify things in our mind. But what the Bible says is the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. Right? He used the foolish things of the world to shame the wise people of the earth. Right? Very good. Thank you, Brother Stephen. Any other answer? Why do you think men make excuses and we do not share the gospel as much? Fear of rejection. Fear of rejection. Uh, that was Brother Yesudas, right? Very, very true. We do not like to be rejected. We don't like to be rejected. We like to be accepted. We like to be praised. We don't like to be ridiculed. Okay, what if this person, you know, uh, think negatively about me? What if it affects my relationship with this person? What if he, he or she thinks that I'm a weirdo? Right? That is so true. Any other answer? Why do you think men do not share the gospel even though we know it's so important? Lost the first love for Jesus. That is so true. Brother Strong Stephen, very good point. We lost our first love. You cannot give what you do not have. If you are thirsty and all that I have is an empty cup, I cannot satisfy your thirst. I have to first of all fill my cup before I can satisfy your thirst. So before we can share the love of God with others, we ourselves need to sit at the foot of the cross. We need to actually download from Jesus. We need to accept his love. We need to experience his grace all over again on a daily basis. And only out of that overflow of that love that we have extra to share with others. Let me tell you what that means, right? When, let me give an analogy. When I was dating my wife, Okay, my girlfriend then, now my wife. I was so, you know, in love with her that in every conversation, I would make sure that she will come out, you know, because I was thinking about her all the time. It wasn't a chore, but I was truly in love with her. I would, sh I would, I would share about, uh, you know, my time being with her, how much I enjoy being with her and all that. And I believe, brothers, you know, when you were dating your girlfriend back then who had become your wife today, you can think of the time when you are thinking of her all the time, right? You have no problem sharing about your spouse or your, or, or your lover, right? And the same thing with Jesus. If you are in love with him, you will not stop talking about him. But the problem is, in the end time, a lot of people have forsaken their first love. And we have become apathetic to the gospel. We don't care anymore. That is so true. Thank you, Brother Stephen, for pointing that out. I'm looking for one more answer that you have not shared. Anyone Fear else? Fear of anger. Answer? Fear of okay. anger. Lord here, love you, Lord. Fear of anger. Fear of anger. You're afraid that they might persecute you. They might punch yep. you in the face, throw you into prison. Yep. Yes, that is, uh, that is very possible. Yes. Any other possibilities? Why don't we share the gospel? Sometimes pride. Pride, okay. But what about we simply do not know how to? Right? Think about it. The gospel is so simple, but yet we have like pieces here and there. Like we've heard about it in the church, but we do not know how to piece them together. 
right? That is why I was so grateful in 2013 when I went to Malang. Okay, and by the way, uh, it, this organization is, is called Evangelism Explosion. Today, I sit on the board of EE Indonesia. And this is a wonderful organization that equip marketplace ministers, church leaders, and uh, a few of us here have been to Malang. Okay, I've been to the center. Yeah, brothers, uh, Brother Loy had been there. Brother Roy had been there. And uh, this is a center that was started by a handful of business people, just like you. 80, 90% of the board members are all business people. But they understand that the Great Commission okay, is a very important mission from the Lord. His last concern should be our first priority. They take out their time. They take out their money. They put their effort together. Okay, and in uh, 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 the year, I think this was dated back about 20 years ago, 1998, all right? They started this ministry. Okay, it, it, it is an international ministry from the States, but in Indonesia, it started at about 1998, if I'm not mistaken. Huh? And I was trained in 2013, and this was a training that changed my life. Because not only was I able to share the gospel anywhere and with anyone, I am able to equip others to do the same as well. Would you like to learn how to do it? Yes? Uh, what do you think is the value of winning one soul in the eyes of the Lord? What do you think the Bible says about the value of one soul? Heavens rejoice. Heaven rejoices, right? But the Bible also says, you know, uh, what does a man gain or profit if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Can he trade you know, his soul for everything in the world? In other words, the Bible is saying the value of one soul is more than everything in this world, all the riches in the world, in this world put together. To God, one soul is more precious okay, than everything that's in the world. That is how precious a soul is. And when we understand that, Okay? When we understand how, how, how precious a soul is to God, don't you think it is worth the time you know, to be equipped to properly know how to share the gospel right? one on one or even when you are in one to a small group? I tell you that is the best investment of my time. I was there for three weeks and after that training, I was on fire. I started to share the gospel wherever I went. When I was in the, in the plane, I shared the gospel to the person next to me. That's the best place. Captive audience, right? What are they going to do if they don't like it? Jump out of plane? They cannot do that, right? When I'm in the Grab car, in taxi, I will share the gospel. I've led many uh, Grab drivers to the Lord, including the Ams, right? And I've heard one of them, you know, he was crying by the end of our time when I reached the airport. And he said, I don't normally cry before strangers, but what you shared with me was so powerful and he was just in tears, right? He said that uh, I felt the power of God. And I led him, you know, to the Lord that day. You see, the gospel is the power of God, Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of it because it's the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. Amen? Brothers, you have been called to this very important task to bring dead men back to life. This is a very, very important mission. The Lord didn't entrust this important mission to the angels. He didn't give it to any other creation, but he gives it to you and me. That is how privileged we are. Such an important task and he gave it to us. All right? Can somebody help me to read 1 Peter 3, 15 to 16? And since we have uh, Peter here as well, why, why don't we have brother Peter to read 1 Peter 3, 15 to 16? Brother Peter, you are muted. Sorry. Okay. okay, got it. But in your heart, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. You do it with gentleness and respect. 16. Having a good conscience so that when you share, when you slander, those who revile you, your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Amen. 
So honor Christ as the Lord as holy in your heart. Be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Brothers, when you start to demonstrate the gospel or the kingdom of God wherever you are, the door to the gospel will be open wide because people will wonder, how come you are behaving different from the rest of the world? How come when you are being wrong, instead of hating the other person, instead of taking revenge, instead of grumbling and complaining, you forgive that person and you love your enemies. You see, when you are going countercurrent to the way of this world, the doors of the gospel will be wide open. That is when people will ask you for the hope that you have in you. And the Bible says that you have to always be prepared to make a defense. Amen? And the best way that you can be prepared is to be equipped. Because I tell you, opportunities are everywhere. In the first year after I've been trained how to do personal evangelism, do you know how many people that I've reached one-on-one? -on -one? I'm not saying this to brag, but I want you to know that uh, you know, there is a big potential in all of us. Right? I, I told you that after the training, I started to share to anyone, to everyone, right? to any place, right? anytime, anyone, any place. I shared the gospel to 270 over people. And more than a third of them came to faith in the Lord Jesus as Lord and Savior. And that blew me away. An ordinary person like me, a businessman, can actually lead so many people to the Lord. And I believe that if God can use me, he can equally use all of you. Now, I'd like to interact with you a little bit. Do you think businessmen have an advantage over pastors in reaching out to other men in their sphere of influence? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, Brother Yasuda say yes. Who else say yes? Can you leave your hand if you say yes? Strong Stephen. Okay, most of you agree, yeah? Okay, Brother Strong Stephen, tell me why, why is it a yes? I say no. Oh, you say no? Uh, <laughs> I say why? no. Okay, why do you say no? It's very much in the mind, very much in the drive. You know, we are in the marketplace. Okay. But but within the whole world. My question is, do you have, if you are a business person, do you have an advantage to, to reach your business partners compared to the same pastor reaching out to the same person? Of course, we have an advantage, right? Why? Because you already have this relationship with that person for years. That person knows you already. They see your lifestyle already, right? If you are to bring your pastor to preach to that person, do you think that person will accept your pastor as openly? As they receive you no right I will share. they they will be they will be putting up the wall of defense they're like okay no no don't bring somebody to preach jesus with me but if you can show that business partner okay demonstrate the kingdom of god okay demonstrate the gospel through the way you live okay then the door will be open for you to share the gospel with that person you see, 270 people, it's not because I have a wide you know, network of influence or because I'm a famous celebrity or anyone. In fact, you meet a lot of people along the way every day in your everyday life. As a business person, we have an advantage, right? I have uh, business partners. I have uh, employees. I have customers. I have suppliers, okay? Then in my family, in my own family, I have my siblings. I have my nephews and my nieces. I have my in-laws, right? Then I have my aunties and my aunts. Then they are their children, right? My cousins. And then I have uh, all the other standard relatives. If you have to just start from, the, from there, there are unlimited. There are so many people that you can reach out to already, right? But the problem is we are not intentional, right? We are not intentional when it comes to evangelism. Why? Because oftentimes we have not been equipped See, not being equipped for evangelism and yet asking them to go out there and share is like sending out soldiers to the battlefield without giving them a weapon. Do you agree? But yeah, there is such a big potential in business people like you, right? Some of you are in the marketplace. You don't need to be a business people. If you're a professional, right? 
you are also very potential in the eyes of God. Okay? And if you are retired, oh man, don't get me started, you know. Retired people are very, very potential people to be used for the kingdom of God. How many of you here are retired? Can I see by a show of hands? Okay, we have, uh, we have quite a number of you who are retired. Now you have to change uh, the word retired to refire. Amen? There is no retirement in the kingdom of God. Okay? You have the time. You have the wisdom. You have the experience. You have the networks. Use that for the kingdom of God. Because one day, we are all going to have to stand before Jesus and he's going to ask us, what have we done with our time, with our talent, with our treasure, okay, with his commandment you know, that he has given us, the great commission to go and make disciples. What have you done with it, brothers? Right? The, 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 the fact is God wants to use you wherever you are. Okay? We all have the same 24 hours. Let's not make excuses. Amen? You have big potential. What about, um, what about young people? Do you think they have potential? Oh, yes. Okay, um, I went to Baguio City in the Philippines to train a group of young people, Filipinos. And I tell you, these young people, they have energy, raw energy, you know, enthusiasm. Right? They have the drive, the motivation, and the creativity. After we have trained them, we brought them to the plaza. And they started to share the gospel with strangers. And then after they shared the gospel, they finished one round, they came back to me. Sir Nelson, can we share with more? I say, of course. And they went for the second round and they shared some more. And they led more people to the Lord. Young people, very potential, right? Because they have a wide network of influence as well. Now it's a media, social media world. Right? Everyone knows like at least 500 people in their circle of influence. You can use the digital platform to reach out to your friends. What about the ladies? Do you think they are potential? Potential people that can be used for the Lord? Oh, yes. Yeah. Brother Yesudas was saying yes, right? You all know that ladies have a 30,000 words quota per day, right? You know, I love to train ladies. In our church in FGA, you know, I, I, I think this was a few years back. I trained a group of ladies from the Women's Life Ministry. There were about 70 of them. And just imagine, yeah, brother, 30,000 words quota multiplied by 70. That is the same like nuclear bomb power. You know what I'm saying? Right? When ladies meet, normally they gossip, right? They talk about their husbands. They talk about, you know, the cheating price going up. They talk about all these things. They are not important. But if we are to equip them, can you imagine the potential? Right? I tell you, after the training, they went out everywhere, to the mall, to the bus, uh, bus stations, to hospitals. Some of them went to the prisons in Kajang. They started to share the gospel. They went in groups. They went in small groups of two or three people. Two months after that, I got a report that shocked me. The leader of that ladies' ministry told me, Nelson, in these two months, our ladies have shared the gospel to 500 over people. And out of that 500 over people, 170 of them gave their life to Christ as Lord and Savior. Can we give him a round of applause? Yeah, give the ladies a round of applause. Yeah, glory to God. Amen? There is such a big potential for everyone if we only are intentional about preaching the gospel. Amen? Now, you all know um, elephant, yeah? Do you know how the circus people train elephants? Because elephants, when they are big, they are very difficult to control, right? How do you make sure that elephants, you know, do not go and roam around everywhere? Do you know how the circus people train the elephant to make sure that they stay in their place? Who knows? Uh, a few of our brothers who have attended the training know. Brother Roy, yeah. share with us. Oh yeah, okay. Brother Yesudas, let's, let's give him a chance first. Just, just a little stick into the ground and they die. Uh, the elephants stay there. <laughs> That's right. But here is the thing. They start from when the elephant was still a baby elephant. They will use a stick. They will put a rope around this elephant's, the baby elephant's feet. All right? And the, 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 the baby elephant 
being such a, a, a small elephant, it will try with all its power to break free, but it will not succeed to do so. And after re doing that repeatedly, the food was hurting already. And eventually the young elephant just gave up. Okay, but many years later, when the elephant has grown much bigger, okay, when he has reached adulthood, when this elephant has become a mature elephant, do you know that the circus people just need to change the rope, the size of a rope, right? Still just need to put a stick and the elephant will not go anywhere. Even though the elephant by potential could have lifted tons of weight, all that the circus people need to do is just to tie a rope and tie it to a, a piece of stick and the elephant is going nowhere. Okay, so answer me brothers. What do you think is tying the elephant to this stick? Is it the rope that is tying the elephant to the stick? Yes or no? No, it's the mind. It's the mindset, brother Chi Yon Long. Thank you, it's the mindset. Now, why do I share this story? It's because a lot of Christians are just like this elephant. Okay, the only problem is you are not that baby elephant, all right? That is powerless. You are like that mature elephants that were tied to the rope. You might think that in the past, I tried to share the gospel. I was all over the place. I failed. I was not able to lead this person to the Lord. I failed back then. I was not successful back then. And therefore, evangelism is not for me. Therefore, God must have not chosen me to reach out to other men. Let me tell you, brothers, if you think like that, you have been imprisoned by your own mindset. Because there is such a potential, such a big potential that God has placed in you. God wants to use you to reach out to your family members. He wants to use you to reach out to your, to your business circle. He wants to use you to reach out to your friends, your relatives, and your acquaintances much more than you ever think of. There is such a big potential, but yet we thought that, okay, once I tried that and I failed, therefore this is not for me. It may be for those who are called Maybe those who have the gifts of evangelism, but it's not for me. But let me tell you, that is a lie. The lie of a devil. Every one of us, if you're willing to be used by God, he wants to use you. Amen? He has given each of us at least one talent. Remember the parable of the talent? Each of us have at least one talent. He wants to use us. Okay, and one day we're going to have to stand before him and we will have to give accounts of how we have used our time, how we have used our talent, how we've used our money. Okay, so I've shared about uh, the three biggest rejections, why Christians don't share the gospel. The three biggest objections. Number one is fear, right? Fear of rejection. Number two is the state of apathy. We simply don't care. Number three, we just do not know how to do it. And let me tell you that the answer to how you can overcome these three objections is as simple as giving yourself to be equipped. Spending some time to be equipped properly, right? Can I hear from um, maybe one of uh, the brothers who have gone through the training, either Brother Roy or Brother Peter or Brother Lloyd? Okay, share with me about the change in paradigm before and after the training. How easy has evangelism been for you after you have gone through the evangel evangelism training? Brother, maybe Brother Peter, he has unmuted himself. Go ahead, Brother Peter. My sharing much more practical. I can share the gospel in five minutes, or if my friend got time, I can share longer. Whereas the last time before I share the gospel, even though I'm a Christian, I started usually with Genesis. Before I could end with Revelation, my friend said, "Now I'm going back. I'm tired, <laughs> so I feel rejected." And uh, I went to EE, and uh, truly, it's very effective. You can share the Kung Fu gospel within five minutes. You want me to show you? <laughs> okay, yes. I think that will be the better one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You want me to show? I can show. Yeah, go ahead, Brother Peter. Okay, you give me the opportunity. I will try my best. Okay, brothers, I have good news for you. Assuming my left hand represents man and my right hand represents God. 
and God wants to give me eternal life. But I cannot receive this eternal life because of my sin. Assuming this handphone is a record of all my sin committed in my life. And God is being a merciful and loving God. But at the same time, God is just. A just God hates sin. And he must punish the sinner. So you see a dilemma between a merciful God who is loving and at the same time a just God who needs to punish the sinner because he hates sin. So what did God do? God sacrificed himself to become man in Jesus. Look, now, God is righteous, is, is righteous and man is a sinner. God put the sin of man upon Jesus himself and now you look, Jesus bore our sin and we become the righteousness of God in him. We are sinless in the eyes of God, we become the righteousness of God. Then what did God do? Jesus died on the cross and before he died, what did he say? He is finished. And what does that mean? It means the, all the penalty of our sin has been paid in full by Jesus. Jesus died, buried, and three days later, he rose from, from death to life. And now, he likes to offer eternal life to man. And man can receive him by faith. Thank you. Does it make sense to you? Awesome. You see, we have not even, uh, I've not even prepared him for it. I call, this is an impromptu. I asked him to share, like uh, I put him on the spot, but he was able to do that, right? That is being ready at all time, brothers. That is the result of giving yourself some time to be equipped properly. So that in any time that you are required to present the gospel, you can do it just like that. Right? And that is what we do, okay? Three, three to four times a year in Malang, we open up a training for leaders in the marketplace and in churches. We train them so that they will be able to bring this back you know, to Malaysia or where, whichever country they come from, so that they will in turn equip all the others in their circle of influence to be able to do the same as well. Now, would you like to learn a simple way how to be able to share like Brother Peter as well? We still have time. You know, Brother Lim just now said, you have all the time in the world. You can even end at midnight if you want to. I say five. <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. yeah. All right. Would you like to learn how to do it? Yes. Okay. Let me share my screen with you. Yeah. All right, this is called the five finger method. Okay, I hope you can all see my screen. It is very, very simple. Okay, so after today, you will be able to share the gospel with anyone, anywhere, even if you only have five minutes. All right, so we go with the five fingers. Do you all remember to bring your five fingers with you when you left your house today? Show me your five fingers. High five, show me your five fingers. All right, okay. So it goes like this. The thumb represents grace. Okay, everybody, repeat after me, say grace. Grace. All right, then the index finger represents man. Okay, the third finger or the middle finger represents God. The ring finger represents Christ and the little finger represents faith. It's very easy to remember. When we talk about grace, okay, we stick our thumb like that. Our thumb is pointing upwards, right? So it reminds us that good grace of eternal life comes from our Father, okay, and it's pointing upwards. Okay, heaven is a free gift from God, right? And then man is represented by our index finger because we like to use this finger to point fingers at others, right? To point other people's fault. So it reminds us of sinful man. 
Okay, the middle finger is the longest finger of all the other fingers. So it reminds us that God is the most high, right? Very easy to remember. Now, ring finger is represented by Christ, okay? Because, uh, because we put a wedding, wedding ring on our ring finger. It reminds us that we are the bride of Christ, right? So this is how you can remember it very quickly. Faith, faith is the little finger. It's the smallest finger, but the Bible says that faith as small as a mustard seed can move mountain, right? So can we all remember it together? Let's recite it together, okay? Grace, is man, man. God, Christ, faith. Simple, right? Now, all that you need to do is just go learn the two points in each gospel point. Come, right? It's like a free ride given to a hitchhiker. Okay? Or when you say something is good, okay, you also put out your tongue. Okay? So, uh, you can unmute yourself. I know that it's going to be a bit chaotic. It's okay. Let us all hear ourselves saying it. Okay? Please unmute yourself. Let us read this together. Okay? The two sentences. One, two, three, go. Eternal life is a free gift of God. Okay, one more time, everybody, right? Eternal life is a free gift of God. It is not earned or deserved. Okay, one more time, yeah? Let us try to memorize this together, right? One, two, three, go. Eternal life is a free gift. It is not earned or deserved. Okay. So index fingers is used to point out the flaws in others. The first point is man is a sinner. Okay. Let's repeat after me. Say man. Man is a sinner. He cannot save himself. He cannot save himself. All right. So let us go back to the first point. Make sure that we remember it. Eternal life is a free gift of God. It is not earned or deserved. A man is a sinner. He cannot save himself. Okay, the third point. God is merciful, therefore doesn't want to punish us. Okay, repeat after me. God is God merciful, is merciful. God is therefore, therefore doesn't, doesn't want to punish us. us. But God is also just, therefore must punish yeah. us for our sin. Okay, one, two, three. God, God is merciful, just, therefore God must God punish God us for our sin. Okay, one more time, God everybody, is right? Just. God, God is, is merciful, is therefore he doesn't want to punish us. But God is God also is just. Okay, now Christ. Christ is both God and man. One, two, three. Christ, Christ is both God, God, God and, and man. man. He died on the cross. He died on the cross. And rose from the dead to, to pay, to pay for the penalty of our sins and purchase the place in heaven for us. Now, I know this sentence is a little bit long. So, what I want you to remember is the word die, rose, pay, purchase. Okay, as simple as that. Die, rose, die, pay, purchase. Okay, one more time. Die, die, die rose, rose, pay, rose, pay, purchase. Okay. And after that, it's very simple. You just fill in the blank. Jesus died where? On the On cross. The cross. Uh, right? He rose from where? For a day. He raised, rose from the dead. To pay for what? The penalty of our sins. Penalty of our sins. And to purchase what? A place in heaven for us. A place in heaven for us. So very simple. Let us repeat the Christ section one more time. Christ is both God and man. What did he do for us? He died on the cross. Rose from the dead to pay for the penalty of our sins and to purchase a place in heaven for us. All right, the last one. Brothers, you're almost there. Saving faith is not blind faith, hate knowledge only, hate knowledge or temporary faith. faith. Okay, one, two, three. Saving faith, faith is not, not blind faith, faith, hate knowledge only, or temporary, temporary faith. faith. 
But saving faith is knowing and trusting in Jesus alone as Lord and Savior and Savior for eternal life. Eternal life. Okay, one more time. Saving faith is knowing and trusting in Jesus alone as Lord and Savior for our eternal life. All right, now I'm going to start from the beginning. Let us all read it without stopping, all right? And try to commit this to memory, yeah? Okay, one, two, three, go. Eternal life, Eternal life is, is the free of God. 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 It is God. not earned and earned. Man, man, is, man a is a sinner. sinner. He, he cannot save himself. himself. God, God is merciful, therefore, he doesn't want to punish us. But God is just, therefore, he must punish us for sin. Christ is both God and man. He died on the cross, cross, rose from the dead, day, day, paid day, for the penalty of our sins. The first day, is the place in heaven for us. Saving faith, Saving faith is not a life faith, hit down with only or temporary faith. Saving faith is knowing and trusting in Jesus alone, alone as Lord, as Lord as and as our eternal life. life. All right, give yourself a round of applause. You see, brothers, being equipped can be as simple as that. You see how duplicable it is. When I, I, I shared about this five-finger method with the elder of our church, he was so excited. He went and he used the same five-finger method and equipped the, the, the Tamil church pastors. The first Tamil church pastor came back and said, I shared with five, three of them gave their life to Christ. The second pastor, oh, by the way, you can mute yourself again, yeah? So we don't hear the background noise. The second pastor came back and said, I shared with five, three gave their life to Christ. The last, is, the last person is a lady a Tamil pastor. And she came back and said, I shared with eight, five gave their life to Christ. It is as simple as that. Brothers, there are a lot of people out there who are already open to the gospel. Okay, they are longing for the hope that you have in you. The world right now is lost. Okay, we are living in a pandemic time where a lot of people are looking for solution. You have that solution. You have that hope. You have the answer that you're looking for. In as, it's as easy as, you know, uh, grace, man, God, Christ, faith. And that can make the difference in a person's eternal life. Okay, they can have a relationship with Jesus starting from today. Okay, so brothers, you know, I, I, I've uh, shared a lot today. I'm going to give you time to, to, to ask some questions. But I just want to encourage you, you know, God has placed you wherever you are for a reason. One day we are all going to see him again. Let us not meet him on that day empty-handed. But let us, you know, utilize our time here on earth to the best of our ability. Let us reach out to men everywhere. Okay, there are people in your circle of influence that you can reach. Okay, you can demonstrate the gospel to them that will open the door to the gospel and then you can proclaim the gospel to them. Okay, remember the Bible says that be prepared okay, in season and out of season to share the hope that you have in you. Amen. And by doing that, the name of Christ is being glorified. Now, I want to tell you that whether that person comes to faith in the Lord at all or not, it is none of your business. It is between the Lord and Him. Our job is just to be a witness. We are just to share. If we don't lead that person to the Lord today, it doesn't mean that that person is doomed for hell forever. It just means that someone else will continue on the work. If you happen to be the one to reap the harvest, know that it is not because of how clever you are or how effective your communication skill is. But it just means that it is the Holy Spirit who convicted his heart and who converted that person and lead that person to Christ. Our job is just to share. The rest of it is the Holy Spirit's job. Amen? Amen, brothers. Okay, uh, I think I would like to have some time, you know, pass back yeah. the time to Brother Lim so all that right. uh, we'll give you some time to ask questions and let's yeah. make this an interactive session, all right? Okay, okay. Brother Lim, 
the yes, foreign teams. Uh, thank you, Brother Nelson. Wonderful session. I'm sure this just the tip of the iceberg of what he has in his in his heart and in his brain. <laughs> just Amen. a little bit, a teaser. Okay, let's ask him the most difficult question, okay? Not a simple <laughs> one. Test him. <laughs> How you want to reach out? What is the most difficult problem you face? And we see. Okay. All right. Who want to be the first one? Okay. Uh, Brother Nelson, Stephen Liu here. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your sharing. Uh, just uh, get your opinions. Uh. Say, recently I was actively sharing the gospel. Well, and for FGB, we're using a one minute weakness. We share in one minute. Oh, it's one minute, one, one minute. Huh? Yep. So I share in a train, and in June alone, within five days, I brought six to the Lord. Then I had my wife got a problem, and I slowed down. And I slowed down for a month or two. And then on the 2nd of September, I brought one uh, grappler to the Lord. And the question now is uh, uh, how can we sustain, uh, sustain that uh, passion? And the fire, you know. Uh, even though I'm sharing every day, uh, using different methods, I have to be very creative now. Uh. I'm using the uh, another method. Of, right? I have to be very creative in my method. And uh, but the question is how to sustain and in the long term, brother. Okay, thank you for the question. Yes, sir. Yep. Before I share, I will open the opportunity to dear brothers. Have you had a similar, uh, you know, um, predicament? You know, maybe at one time you were very passionate for the gospel, but somewhere along the line, you kind of lost it. Do you know the reason why and how do you get back on fire again? Does anybody would like to share before I, before I share mine? Has any of you ever experienced that? Yes? I believe at one point or another, we have lost that fire, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, my guess is this. It is so true that sometimes, you know, we do evangelism out of our zeal, right? Out of our passion. Maybe we have just completed evangelism training and, you know, we, are, we, we have this fire in us. But after some time, you know, we, we kind of lost the passion for it. And everybody experienced that, you know, I... I I know very well what you're talking about, Brother Stephen. And uh, this is what I, uh, this is what I, I, I uh, recommend or what I suggest, right? It is the same with any worthwhile journey, right? Let me give you the analogy from when I uh, embark on my journey to lose weight, okay? So what do you need to be able to sustain that fire, okay? So we all know, evangelism is one of those things that we know but we don't do, <laughs> right? It's just like uh, staying healthy. We know that in order to stay healthy, we need to eat right, we need to exercise right, we need to get enough rest. But how many of us are doing that consistently on a daily basis? We don't. And the same thing with the Great Commission. We know that it's a very important command from the Lord. We know that we need to reach out to the men around us, but the problem is we just don't find the motivation to do it. So just knowing about it is different from us actually doing it. Don't you agree? Right? So um, one day, a friend of mine invited me to this club at okay, 8 a.m. in the morning. I still remember. And it turned out to be uh, one of the many MLM companies in, in, in Malaysia. Right? But uh, in his presentation, and, and by the way, what uh, led me to be so interested in, in, in you know, coming is, I saw his picture that he posted on Facebook. He said, I was like 93 kg, now I'm like 74 kg. I lost almost 20 kg in, in, in I think, a period of 15 months. So I, I got curious and I asked him, what happened to you? He said, if you want to know, come to the center at 8 a.m., right? So I went there and they went through the whole presentation with me. And they showed me pictures after pictures of um, people who have undergone the transformation the before and after pictures, right? Some people have lost like 15 kg, some have lost even more, some have lost 
uh, as little as five or, 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 or three kg and all that. But everybody was losing some weight. So I, I believe that, uh, you know, uh, evangelism and discipleship is a little bit like that as well, right? So I was inspired, number one, because I saw role model. I saw people who have done it, and I saw people who have been doing it as a lifestyle, right? So that is the first component if you want to keep the fire going. You must, you must have a role model of people who are doing it, and there is success story. There is somebody that you can look up to. There is somebody that you can learn from. Then the second thing that they did, when I said, yes, I'm so, I want to be a part of this program. Then they put a chat group, they put me in it, and they assigned two coaches, actually three coaches, okay? And they keep me accountable. And they say, everything that you eat from this point onwards, take a picture of it, send it to the chat group. And then they'll tell me whether it's, uh, uh, it's allowed or not, whether it's healthy or not. Okay, if, if, it's, if it doesn't fulfill their criteria, they're gonna tell me, they're gonna give me comments and feedback and I need to change my eating habit and, and, and food that I eat. And then the third thing that they did, they put me in another chat group with even more people in it. And in that chat group, they celebrate when somebody makes some kind of progress in their weight loss journey. So I thought about it and, hey, this is so similar to discipleship. And the reason why Christians are not motivated to do evangelism and discipleship is because oftentimes we do it as a lone ranger because we do not have that community to support us. Oftentimes, we do not see a role model, people who have successfully done it. So we do not see like, a, we do not have like a benchmark, people to model after, right? Then the second thing is the coach. We do not have somebody to keep us accountable, okay? Just like how they make me accountable for everything that I eat, whether I do my exercise or not, whether I drink my shake or not, right? I have to be accountable to them, right? And then the third element is community, a community of like-minded people who are doing it. You see, there's something about men, okay? When you are a part of people who are doing the same thing, okay, eventually you are also going to be motivated. You are going to be inspired to do the same thing again and again, okay? And if you get uh, motivated by the people around you, even though it is a small progress, okay, you feel the fire again. So I would say that you need all these three things as well. A role model, a coach, and a community. That is what will help to keep the fire going. Okay. okay so more than the method, I think, is the heart. Okay. How are you going to do it? So that helps. Okay. Sorry, Thank Brother you. Lim. Thank you, uh. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Steven. So now we have to work, put action into the plan. Yes. Nelson will be our, our coach. Amen. <laughs> I have brother Peter, I have brother Loy, I have brother Roy to help me as well. Yeah. I think we need to make in the groups because the proverb yes. that says, uh, if you walk alone, you can walk very fast, but you want to walk long and far, you have to have a group. So we have to form groups. I think uh, brother Stephen has been leading this uh, one minute evangelism. He have formed some groups under FGB before. Uh, there were um, some groups to form already. The uh, actively will be Peter Dashman, I see myself, uh, which I'm going around many chapters uh, sharing the one minute weakness. Uh, that's what I know. So basically, it's, uh, it's not functioning, right? I would say not functioning effectively. So it's very much personal. Make some noise. I, Yes, Raymond. Hey, go ahead. Oh, I'm I'm inside the group. I'm also in the one minute weakness group. So yeah. uh, we were uh, so excited. We put in, you know, evangelism, uh, share gospel pictures, you know. But during this pandemic, a bit down, uh, So we must activate back again. Yeah. So this is a platform to get excited again. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Our brother Raymond and uh, Stephen and the rest. Okay. We have to <laughs> reactivate MCO, and we can put Nelson as our coach as well. He can he can give us some leads or some help. Yeah, strong Stephen Liu include uh, brother Nelson. Nelson inside the group. 
yeah. for a while, for a while, okay? <laughs> so, uh, Brother Nelson, can you put in your, your handphone into this uh, chat so I can... Uh, yeah, sure. Can, no problem. I can, I can clue you in. Sure. Yeah. And we then can meet in Suba. Run the call, you know? Let him yeah. uh, start the fire first. Restart. Okay. Give me your give me your handphone, uh, Nelson. I write down. I'll yeah. send it to you. Let the link and forward it to you. I'll but anyway, you. brothers, uh, you know, I, I know that during MCO it's not convenient to meet up in person, but you can always still share the gospel and disciple people over Zoom. Okay, just to share a very in, um, encouraging testimony. You know, um, one of our members uh, who have been equipped with this EPE, yeah, Effective Personal Evangelism. She has been uh, she's in the young uh, a youth church and they were doing Zoom meetings like almost on a daily basis and they've been inviting people to join, non-believers to join as well. And during MCO, you know, all these young people, they do not have anywhere to go and they were bored at home. So they said, okay, you know, when they received the invitation to join these Zoom meetings. And over the Zoom meetings, you know, because they have been equipped, they built friendship with them. Okay, this is important. Before you share the gospel, you have to touch the hearts first. You have to build friendship first. You, they must know that you care for them first. They must really know that you are a friend okay, before you earn the right to speak into their life. So after they built friendship, they started to share the gospel. And you know, in the few, I think two or three months, in a short, brief few months, they led 112 souls to the Lord. All these young people. Through Zoom, they don't meet in person. Okay, so... It goes to say that, you know, the Holy Spirit can work through the limitation of uh, space. There's no distance in the spiritual realm. Amen? So people were crying over Zoom. Uh, there were miracles of healing and all that that happens over Zoom. Okay, so God can still work through the digital platform. That is a good news. Okay, so we can be creative lah. Just because it's MCO doesn't mean we cannot share the gospel. Uh, Brother Nelson, what do you think of using uh, other platform like uh, Facebook? Uh, what, what do you think? Uh? Um, like Facebook chat or messages? What kind of uh, Facebook? Yeah, Facebook just uh, talk through the Facebook, you know? Of course you can. Definitely you can glorify God through like posting um, messages that will touch people and all that. But I will still say that nothing can replace the uh, in-person okay, in uh, ministry, right? Because there's the personal touch that goes to it. Think about your own journey with Christ. How long did it take you, that person who reached out to you before you actually uh, really had this strong walk with the Lord? It took, it, 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 it's a pro, over a process of time, isn't it? It's not something that happens overnight. Right? So it's not a touch and go kind of thing. But you need to actually build relationship with them and uh, you need to actually impart life onto them. You see, Jesus has never commanded us to make converts. He commanded us to make disciples. And there's a very big difference between converts and disciples. Converts, they are fans, right? They only follow Jesus when everything is going well. But disciples, they are the committed ones who will go all the way. Okay, they are the ones who will make Jesus not only as the Savior, but also as the Lord over their life. Okay, remember just now I shared about gospel of the kingdom. Okay, it's not just about, okay, accepting Jesus as Savior. When we die, we go to heaven. No. We are bringing people in a relationship with Jesus so that Jesus will be the king over their life, will be the Lord over their hearts, so that he will transform them inside out. That is the essence of a gospel. So that they who were dead spiritually will come alive again. Yeah, and, and I think that it needs to happen over a, a period of time. So I wouldn't use, uh, Facebook has its place, but I wouldn't use that as a primary way to reach out to people, especially to uh, make disciples of them. It has its limitation. Yeah. Okay, let's give others a chance. Anyone else who want to ask a question? Okay, uh, Nelson. Yes, Brother uh, Roy. Wait. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, I just want to ask something. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, uh, that God has always wanted us to bring the kingdom of God 
onto earth. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Okay. We, uh, is Malaysia right now under kingdom, like the kingdom system, or is this democracy? Democratic. Yes. Sorry? Kingdom. It's not kingdom. It's democracy. It's not democracy. Yeah. Democracy. Uh, see, uh, in inverted commas. Yeah. Inverted commas. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> it is a bit difficult for us to understand the concept of kingdom because we have been uh, brought up under this system of democracy, right? So we don't understand uh, the, the concept of a kingdom. But uh, you know, when the British were colonizing uh, Malaysia, okay, or, or when a kingdom colonized another nation, okay, what they will do is they will send five regents. Okay, what is regents? Regents are representatives of a kingdom who have the same authority as the sending nation. Okay, the regents will be there to impose Okay, all the rules, the regulations, the values, the principles of the sending nation. So that the colonized nation will also uh, be another kind of uh, an extended territory of the original kingdom. Okay, are you following me so far? So in the same way, when God created man, okay, he placed man as the five regions on earth. So that we will live out God's kingdom rule, uh, his His. Uh, uh, his values, his principles, so that we will live in love, we will carry out, you know, the kingdom values, right? We live in, in, in loving one another, we will uh, forgive one another, right? We will live out the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. That has always been God's uh, uh, purpose right from the beginning. But what happened was, men do not want to submit under God's authority, okay? We we rebel against him and we come out of that rule. So instead of God being the king and the Lord over our life, now the one who is enthroned in our hearts is ego. You see? But when we understand the gospel, we surrender our life to him. Okay, so the gospel is more about just accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It is about surrendering our life to him. So that now it is not ego, our own ego that is enthroned anymore. It is Jesus enthroned in our hearts as King and as Lord. Okay, that means He is ruling our life and the world around us, okay, through us. He's working in and through us, okay, so that in our life we display the kingdom of God. We do things for His glory, no longer for our own glory. Okay, so that is why uh, we need to display His kingdom everywhere that we go. Okay. That is, uh, in essence, what the gospel of a kingdom is all about. Okay. To display the rulership and the kingship of Jesus in all areas of our life. Does that answer your question, Brother Roy? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Last question. Last one. Stanley, Five minutes. Can I, can I say something? Yes, Brother Stanley. Okay. Yes, I thank you for... Brother Nelson, who is so good in that uh, fingers evangelism. And uh, I follow what you said about kingdom and discipleship. I guess that is the gist of it, that uh, many people, if I, if I can just, not so much a question, but I think just affirm what you shared just now, in terms of these three words, uh, win, disciple, and send. So just now the evangelism is very much on winning of uh, someone to Christ, which is great. But that one is insufficient in the sense that it's still very selfish. Because you talk about transportation. Yeah, now I receive Christ and therefore I have no need to worry because when I die or whatever, I will go to heaven. Yep. So that's still very selfish because you're talking about transportation. But the next thing that you just now rightly mentioned about discipleship and kingdom, that's talking about transformation. So from transportation to transformation, there's a great, great price to pay in terms of Christians like us, FGB and so on, because that is a long, long journey. To bring one to Christ, of course, is the power of the Holy Spirit. It could be five minutes, half an hour, ten minutes, one minute. But 
to disciple that is a lifelong. So I want to thank God that uh, my own personal journey being so stubborn of a Buddhist, free thinker, atheist, pro-communist, and then I hate people who carry the Bible. Wow. So I got, I got a little soul in me. Uh, so don't talk to me about Jesus, you know. But somehow, long story short, I became a Christian. If not because I was being led to be trained as disciple and have I have mentor and have mentees, I think my life could be a very different one now. And so I, I totally agree in terms of why we form groups and then yeah, we bring five to Christ, we bring ten and three grab driver, da da da. Uh, thank God I did uh, bring two grab driver to Christ and then just uh, last week brought uh, three from Christ to Zoom and WhatsApp, audio, not, not audio, video. So he can see me, I can see him. But then the next question, how to follow them up? Mm. So this is the part I think uh, beside forming the evangelism group or chat group, we should have another one all together, I don't know. Uh, a tandem of evangelism and discipleship so that those people who are good in evangelism because Ephesians 5, like the 5 four, some mm -hmm. are very good in evangelism uh, but some you know, are very good in disciple and some are pastors and so on and so on so I guess that uh, besides those wonderful things you mentioned about role model, lifestyle, success story, accountability, celebration this is so wonderful so if I may just, uh, uh, um, just uh, trigger this, uh, besides just evangelism group, that whether we have a combined or a separate group or discipleship group, because since then I was involved in discipleship. I mean, I was uh, trained by navigators and our guy. So I thank God for that. Uh, because uh, it, it just takes another DNA uh, to do that. Yeah. So I think God brought you here uh, today perhaps is to strengthen and energize. Uh, you know, I think Brother Stephen mentioned you got four in the group. Uh, but then, you know, the fire is not there, whatever. So, so let, let's see. It's it just that uh, I just find that, you know, win, send, disciple, and send. Of course, then we have disciple group then, you know, where to send, you know, to, to different places and so on. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Stanley. Thank you, Brother Stanley. Um, maybe as a parting message and to conclude what we've shared, um, it is so true, you know, Jesus has not called us to be convert, but he has called us to be disciples. And you know, my greatest fear is, you know, when we only bring people into a relationship with Christ that is fake and that is shallow, and in a way they are deceived, thinking that they are safe when they have actually never repented of their sins, when they have never truly known Jesus as their Lord. Because remember in Matthew 7, 21, the, the Lord Jesus said, not everyone who call me Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the Father in heaven. On that day, many, he said, he will call on to me. It's not calling Muhammad or, 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 or Buddha Lord. They are calling Jesus Lord. But Jesus said, depart from me. I never know you, you workers of lawlessness. See, more than just uh, accepting him as Lord and Savior, okay, it is, that is not the essence of a gospel. The essence of a gospel is actually the Lordship of Jesus in our life. That means you are actually transformed inside out, like what Brother Stanley said. And he said, you know, you have to count the cost of discipleship. If you know that he is Lord, he must be the first priority in your life. Okay, you, he must be the first thing in your life over your family members, over your convenience, over money, over your personal agenda, over your personal ambition, over everything in your life. Okay? And if you understand the true value of what Jesus is offering, then it will not sound like a big demand after all. Let me give you an analogy. None, none of you, I believe, will ever pay me 10,000 US dollars for this phone. Right? It's a nice phone, it's an iPhone, but None of you will want to pay me 10,000 US dollars for this, right? No. No. But if let's say I offer you a red Ferrari, I know it's too good to be true, 
But if I offer to you a new, brand new red Ferrari for $10,000, would you say that that is a great value that you're going to take up? Yes, Brother Yesudas? Yes. Even if you do not have the money, do you think you're going to find ways to get $10,000 so you can get a red Ferrari for me? Yes. Definitely, right? So yeah. what has changed in this scenario? How come you will not pay me $10,000 a phone, but you will willingly look for $10,000 that you do not have in order to get the red Ferrari from me? Why is that so? What is different between the phone and the oh, Ferrari? In the Ferrari. We know the value of the Ferrari and we know the value of the phone. Exactly. I can use, I can use a 1,000 ringgit phone to use the same mm. function. Yeah. Exactly right. The value is different. One Ferrari is worth many, many phones, right? And in following Jesus, oftentimes we only look at the cost. We only look at the $10,000 and we often complain, Lord, why do you make it so difficult? But brothers, do you understand the value that he offers to us if we are to truly offer him, if we are truly follow him wholeheartedly? First Corinthians, I'd like to close with this. Yeah? First, uh, sorry, Second Corinthians 4.17 says this, for this light momentary affliction, the Bible calls it light and momentary, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Okay, 2 Corinthians 4.17. He's saying that, yes, you might have to pay a little bit of cost while you are here on earth. It might be a little bit uncomfortable. You might be persecuted because of me, right? You might be misunderstood. You might be ridiculed. You might be rejected when you obey my commandments to go and make disciples. But, it is preparing for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. When you get to, uh, to heaven to be with him, when you see him face to face, you are going to know that the cost that you pay is so insignificant compared to the value you know, of the glory that he has prepared for those who obey his commandments. Amen? So I just want to encourage all of you, brothers, you know, Count the cost, but don't look at the cost. Look at the value. Amen. Amen. Back to you, brother. Praise Lynn. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. And I'm the valuer. Praise the Lord. <laughs> 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 okay. We ask uh, brother Nelson to pray for us and uh, just to bless sure. us. Thank you. Okay. Value let us of the, value of the earthly matters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, brothers, let's join our hearts. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, in these two hours, we have discussed a lot of things yes, pertaining Lord. to your kingdom of God. And Lord, your word says that this light and momentary affliction, the trouble that we are going through right now, for you, for your kingdom, for the gospel, for the Great Commission, is nothing compared, Lord, to the value of the eternal weight of glory that you have prepared for your children. Lord, we long for that day when we meet you face to face. We are not going to come before you empty-handed, empty but we have done our best with the limited time that we have on earth to touch as many lives as possible, to impact as many lives as possible. So that, Lord, when we return back to you, Lord, that is the very least that we can do to show our gratitude of all the things that you have done for us. Lord, we know that we are living at the end of the end time. That time is drawing very near towards mm. the end. We are waiting for your second coming. And, and, and it's an imminent uh, second coming because we know that all the signs are pointing back to your soon return. We have limited window of time for us on earth, not to show the world what the gospel is all about, to demonstrate the gospel and to also proclaim it in every opportunity, opportunity that we have. So, Father, I pray for all the brothers in FGB. Yes, Lord. Lord, it is one of the core objectives of FGB to reach men everywhere, to equip men for the Great Commission. And Lord, so that in the end, Lord, it will all result in glory for your name. Because mm. that is why you have created men. 
so that we will glorify you in our life and to enjoy you forever. I pray for every brothers in this, in this Zoom meeting and in FGB. Yes. Burn our hearts once again yeah. for the Great Commission so that your, con uh, your last concern will be our first priority. Thank you, Lord. Bless our time. Lord, even as we finish our meeting uh, right now, I pray that your spirit will continue to speak to us and will continue to work in and through us. Thank mm. you, Lord. We commit this time unto you. In Jesus' mighty and precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Wonderful session. Thank you, everyone, yes. for coming. Yes. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. you. Nelson. I hope you've been blessed. Brother Nelson, you know, the wonderful you dissemination. About, wonderful. Yes, Not only that, Would your you language, you know, you, you, it's so clear, precise. so precise, so concise. And uh, it was a okay. beautiful Hello. session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yes, thank you. Thank you. God thank you. bless you all. Have a, have a blessed weekend. Wonderful time.